um, is to welcome two, two guests who I'd invite to, to join us on the stage. Uh, Ulrike Gero, um, who is been thinking about and working in, in European affairs for uh, several years, and Hoka Bronkhorst, who is Professor of Sociology at the University of Flensburg. And we thought we would use this, this panel, I'll move slightly closer, um, we'll use this panel to react to uh, what we've just discussed, um, and we try and perhaps open it up to the audience uh, once again. I wanted to pose um, the following double question, perhaps, to... Gosh, it's like moving house. Um, the, the, the first uh, question to open this up was that um, if you look at the, 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 the graphs and the maps that Saskia has, has presented to us, uh, very interesting, also could be quite terrifying. Um, the, I mean, the, 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 the catastrophic scenario um, which one could uh, see in such figures uh, and, and, uh, and graphs uh, could lead actually to a um, reduction of agency to do something about it. So the first part of the question is, um, how can we find the courage to address uh, such issues and the second part of the question relates to that, and it also relates to what Daphne said at the beginning, that we're all well aware, particularly here in Europe, uh, but I think throughout the world, that there are many people who are very fr afraid of what is happening. Um, and uh, if we're to create change, we need to bring those people with us. Now, in your, in your figures, um, there were many that concerned Hungary. Um, over these last couple of days in our camp, We've been talking about the situation in Hungary, uh, quite a bit the political situation in Hungary. And at least one part of understanding what's going on in Hungary right at the moment is to say, well, people uh, have seen what has happened um, when it comes to home repossessions and, and the way that resources are being taken out of the country um, in a globalized economy. And they've said, you know what, we don't like that at all. Uh, and there's a, there's a nationalist... Uh, backlash. So, I mean, that's the second, the second part of the question is, how can we go about uh, persuading people, addressing this uh, other class? Uh, it's, it's, it's not the nicest way to put it like that, but, but the large group of people who will be very afraid of uh, what's going on and saying, no, actually, look, the answer is not trying to turn the, the clock backwards. The answer is to, to think of a multi-sided uh, movement or, or, or something along these lines. So I don't know who might want to jump at that huge question. <laughs> Please. So, um, so I, I start. And I'm, I'm very happy on a Saturday afternoon, indeed, to see such an outcome uh, of, of young people. And I, if I may, I want to start with a very personal remark uh, relating back to Daphne's introduction. I'm on many, many panels on Europe. Most of them, it's old white men. And it's those who hold, in sociological terms, the discourse coalition. And then it's always talks about bureaucracy or subsidiarity and freedom and the whole thing. And basically, you move out and you were asked precisely the question that Daphne posed in her uh, introduction, which is, when did lo Europe lose its credibility? And I'm around with this question also for two or three years in my personal lifetime, because in a way I'm realizing that I was part of that discourse coalition for very long, <laughs> being in many think tanks and doing the whole thing of bureaucracy, subsidiarity, institutional questions, blah, 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 and that something has happened, and the something is really what Daphne pointed to. Something has happened where Europe lost its credibility. I think it's broader than um, finances. It's also the citizenship question. And it's what you pointed to, Nicolo. It's this huge delivery gap between what we pretend to do, which is freedom, prosperity, uh, refugees, sort of the best value set of the world, which is what we always pretend to be in respect to the US, especially in respect to Putin's Russia and to China. And here we are with all these pictures and none of it is true. And you pointed to a couple of pictures, you know, in terms of environmental protections. You're just coming back from the European Council. Uh, you saw the news about these climate goals. And again, we are basically in a huge delivery gap. So here's my point, And I don't have answers to the very complex question. But uh, 
I think we have three Europes. Um, because Daphne talked about two Europes. One Europe is definitely you, the people I'm seeing here in this room, which is young, smart, educated, willing on a Saturday afternoon, instead of looking sportschau, doing talks about Europe and the environment and the whole thing. Yeah, That is the forward-looking branch, right? The other is what I see many times when I'm not in places like this, but say in Dillingen an der Donau or in wherever I can go to do the so-called citizen talks about Europe. Yeah, And what I see there is older, uh, old discourse, uh, sometimes also concerned. Huh? They are sometimes also concerned, but sometimes very easy to be caught away with this, you know, standardized, too much migration, too much uh, should Germany pay for everything, the austerity talk and so. So I think indeed there's two Europes, but there's a third Europe. And again, and this comes, I think, much back to what uh, Saskia told us, there is still an elite sort of discourse coalition who holds the Deutungshoheit. Yeah? And the, I, I think what we are confronted with is really that we have too many defenders of the Europe that exists, which is, which is, the, which is the problem in itself, because in these sort of discourse coalition, the people who are in the European Parliament today, who are doing the TTIP stuff, who are doing the data protection stuff, who are sitting in the European Parliament, in the Commission, and so there is also many smart people who basically want Europe to be strong, efficient, and so on, so on, and so forth, but in a way they are caught by so many institutional interests that they lose precisely the citizens. So what is happening there is sort of, a, I'm just trying to, to depict this while I speak, is that because those who are also defending the system as it exists, but the system as it exists is no longer convincing, we are losing the majority at large. We are losing the citizens. And some th something is happening there, which I'm just trying to capture myself in the past months or years. And I think it's really important just to, to think a second while this uh, intertwinement basically probably creates the delivery gap we are all facing. Yeah, Because those who are in the defenders of Europe sort of discourse, I don't want to say that these are bad people. Many of them are good, smart MEPs who try to do a smart agenda in the European Parliament and so on and so forth. Many people in the Commission really want to make Europe work. The Council is a little bit more pro problematic, right? But whatever we see is that we do have this institutional sort of setting there, which is in complete disruption to what the citizens want in Europe and that the citizens cannot articulate and what the citizen would like to articulate basically produce the delivery gap from the system to the people, and this is why we fuel the populism across the European Union. So with that saying, I haven't answers to any of the, of, the, of the question, but at least I was trying to find my own personal sort of analysis of what is this happening, and I, it was worse for me to basically depict this in my own change from a, say, former discourse coalition to hopefully a new discourse which is building up here. Okay. You can, you can tell you can tell that we're very uh, happy to welcome you in the in the other camp. Uh, European alternative sounds like the the place for you. Uh, Hokai, so are you reaching for the mic? Yeah, um, I mean this gloomy picture you painted. Yeah. As I was smiling a lot. Eh? Yeah, you were smiling a lot. Sure. It's, uh, to, it's to activate. Yeah, to yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, 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 sure. No, but uh, the problem is. Uh, uh, the problem is, uh, what can we do? Yeah, what can we do? And um, uh, what is needed is, uh, as you said, transversal uh, or transnational solidarity, a reconstruction of solidarity on transnational levels, just because the blackmailing power of the economy has gone global. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and that is the situation. And it needs some blackmailing power on the other side <laughs> to cope with that. Yeah? And in the, as long as capital and capitalism was with, based within the national states, national parliaments and national unions, after long struggles, exactly. could, yeah, could cope with it, had a balance in blackmailing power. And that's now the problem on the global level, on the European level. I can just 
go on the European level. It is amazing. There was a study from Gebhardt and others uh, just uh, two years ago, or one year ago, came, came it out after the crisis in Europe. Amazingly, the solidarity between feelings and willingness between European citizens had increased, oh, increased. dramatically. 85% of the Polish people, 78% the, 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 the uh, 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 constitution breaking majority is that, yeah? When of the Spanish this? of the 2013 and 2012, yeah? Of the, of the Spanish people are for minimal wages all over Europe. So the Spanish have some. Uh, interest in it, and the Polish people either. Right. But the Germans, yeah, yeah, wait. 58% <laughs> of the Germans are, want minimum wages, even if they lose their own, uh, uh, if their own wages are decreasing. Yeah, so the solidarity feelings and willingness and there are a lot of more indicators yeah, that show that there is a stable interest of Europeans in European, organizing European solidarity. But now comes the problem. <laughs> the problem is, yeah, you gave the right answer. The people have to reoccupy the alienated uh, decision-making institutions. Yeah? However, how to do that in a situation where these institutions have been transformed deeply through globalizations, where decisions are no longer made within the national states, are made by executive bodies, at best by lawyers, yeah? uh, if they are made by some uh, people who have, are not so much so close to power, yeah? uh, they uh, are made uh, uh, um, directly uh, by the big firms uh, and where national states are transformed into firms. Yeah? So in, in that situation, there, is no longer, there are no longer institutions that work in a way that is democratic. Yeah? They are designed to avoid conflict. They, and the European Union is the best example. They are designed to bypass, not willing, no, not intentionally, but, but by uh, an evolutionary process. They are designed to bypass public opinion. There is public opinion, there is public sphere, there is a civil society. There are so many NGOs. However, what is not there any longer are institutions where these conflicts, which are in civil society clashing in, cre in crisis situations, yeah, where these conflicts can be discussed and decided in real alternatives. And therefore, the blackmailing power goes through via from the capital, from the investors, and the investor strikes via uh, Angela Merkel and uh, what is the French name? The, the, the poor president of France, yeah, who started with a socialist agenda. It may not be very clever, uh, may, may not have been very clever, yeah, but a couple of months of investment strikes were enough to increase the uh, uh, unemployment rates in France, and it was over. Yeah? So we need, in, in the national states, we need some, and, and that is really a huge thing because nothing shows uh, uh, and then I'm, uh, I, I, I end my, my intervention yeah so uh, 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 nothing sh nothing uh, there are no, no, no much indicators that something like that evolves yeah we need transnational effective transnational legislators who can yeah who can Pose alternative political strategies, alternatives between, let me say simply, neoliberalism and uh, Keynesianism. 
Nobody knows what works. But if this alternative were decided by elections and campaigns and public debates, then the people had a say in it. And then it would be clear that can be changed. We can try this or that. We can no longer try this or that. And it needs some organization uh, in the civil society that becomes an equivalent to that what unions were in national states. So at least in a situation where the gap between rich and poor is so high and where the working population is the majority now in the world, in that situation, Microphone. it would, it would, yeah, but uh, I, I'm not enough, I think. Uh, but, uh, uh, um, uh, in, uh, Okay, okay. That, uh, that, uh, in that situation, it needs some functional equivalent for, uh, uh, or it needs some kind of uh, transnational union power. And it's not to see how to reach that. Yet. Okay. So, please. But maybe you have an idea. Uh, uh, Saskia, but, but it would be interesting to hear on the fear question and also on this other forms of. Organization, actually, it will come alive, I believe, the microphone when you start speaking. Yeah. So, well, thank you. These were two great sets of statements. And yes, 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 yes. But a few. Uh, so, um, I think that one big issue, I, I'm going to start with your question, your example of Hungary. Um, I think that one big issue is the poverty of politics. I think politics is important. I, I had a sentence in there, I don't know if people picked up on it, that the political is meant to intermediate the visceral, the panic, the fear, the sense of impotence. The political is an intermediate space where multiple differences can actually produce something. And the political is lost, as you described, right? It's administrative, it's this, it's coalitions, it's that. But we have really lost. And I think in losing the political, we have all... And I mean the political in a good, powerful sense, which doesn't mean that we all agree. Huh? On the contrary, it is a way of negotiating differences. But finding something, it is also an act of making the political. And most politicians... They would not recognize what I'm talking about right now. Huh? They would not see it that way. So I think that that's a critical issue. The poverty of political language means that people have very few options. The fact that we have become consumers of our citizenship means that we don't have the tools even to say, wait a minute, that's not the only way. And the United States is exhibit number one. We, people spend so much time in front of television, which is so stupid and so bad and so violent and so I don't know what, that there simply is no political speech and the level of ignorance is extraordinary. Now, the United States is pretty extreme for a highly developed country, so to speak, right? So, I, But that is how bad it can get. And for all I know in Germany, there are growing sectors who are going a, a little bit in that direction. You sort of check out. Powerlessness means also another incentive to check out. Back to the Occupy movements. The Occupy movement, it, that's hard work. That is not a demonstration on a weekend, beautiful day. You meet people and friends, you hang out, you make music. No, that was hard. I would like to know how many spent at least three nights in an occupied site. Because in New York, and then we had arranged heating. Guess what? The police came and destroyed all the heating arrangements, stuff like that. People checking on the temperature of, of people who were sleeping. That was making the social, we, they made something there. When critics say, oh well, that was nothing, you know, they didn't get anything, they didn't have a party, no. Because the one thing, back to your comment on the state, we need to reoccupy the state. The state, people think that I'm sort of against the state, that I don't know where they got that. Maybe because I work on globalization, no. I think that the state is a complex capability, far more complex than the richest corporation. The richest corporation, no matter how global, no matter how complex its lawyering and accounting systems, one single logic organizing it. And that is its survival, its profitable survival, right? The state has to negotiate. A working state is a space where you have many, many, back to the political, right? Many, many different positions each one with its forceful argument. The labor side is different from the corporate side, it's little from the health sector, is different from the et cetera, et cetera. 
the state has historically shown itself to be highly imperfect, yet capable of doing that kind of work. And our states are becoming so corporate and so passive. There is no innovating. There is adjustment, adjustment. Who's dictating what needs to be done? Finance. Why did the 7 trillion, 17 trillion of our money go to all these banks when the ba and with no conditionalities, right? That would have said, okay, we're giving to give you this money because we want you to recirculate it among the millions and millions of little firms who are doing fine but need loans. The households who need loans, the students who need loans at reasonable, they didn't even ask. So off it went into more financial instruments. So when I say finance, you know, finance is just one very powerful vector around which others agglutinate, and it's just part of the story. I don't mean to say that it is the story. So we lack, I, I think the one of the biggest deficiencies is in the zone of the political. Now, that is why I think this kind of citizen movement, and you described it very well as in Daphne, right, that this other kind of citizenry that is beginning to mobilize, I think that is very important. And the Occupy movements, thanks goodness that they didn't align with, with existing political parties, because that is precisely not the point. The point is to find something else. And I think it's one point in a trajectory. Now, I want to mention a couple of things about organizing. Coming back to your final comments, which were very, very, I think I agree with a lot of what you said. But there are, here are a few buts. So where is most of the energy coming for labor organizing today in the United States? It's those sectors that have immigrants in them. You know why? Not because they are so far ahead or they come from political cultures where organizing is still believed in. That may be a bit. But it's because the, the worker who strikes, who's organizing and who strikes, for instance, at night goes back to a community where everybody sits around the table and says, how did it go? And they help each other, etc. They help each other because they have been discriminated against. They've got to help each other. Not that they all love each other. They also hate each other. Huh? I, mean, I don't want to romanticize. I have now participated in two major efforts in the United States, two which started on the West Coast. I was in LA for a while. And on, on justice for janitors, you know justice for janitors? The janitors are the, the, the people who clean the big corporate office district, so to say. It took them 15 years, they succeeded. They organized. Where did they organize? In the corporate centers. Boston, Chicago, New York, etc. Suburbs, forget it. Office parks, forget it. Corporate center, where they are needed, and there they, second major victory, domestic workers organization, found it. Two years ago, three years ago, where did they, that is women who do mostly women? It doesn't have to be only women who do, uh, you know, child care and cleaning in the houses, you know, all that kind of care work. Uh, they could in New York they have organized. This is a New York based, and that I'm going to get to the local versus the global here. So um, two years ago they succeeded. Where did they succeed? Park Avenue, all the rich areas in Manhattan. Those households, and this to me is a point of strategy that I want to mention. I have long been, the task that you do is one thing. Where you do the task, let's say cleaning a floor, actually makes a difference. So I say that there is a whole set of spaces, those, those geographies that I was describing, you know, a whole set of spaces that are really part of a strategic infrastructure for this global economy. If you're a cleaner in one of those households, if you're the janitor in one of those buildings, you are in the job, in the work of maintaining a strategic infrastructure. You can call me, so I tell these, these women, you can call me a cleaner, but you know what? The household that I clean, if anything goes wrong, that's going to affect Wall Street. You know, that is a bit the image. You, you see what I'm saying? Korean workers, they are still one, some of the strongest. When they organize, they immediately go international. I regularly get, these are mostly heavy metal, whatever kind of unions. They immediately get support from the United States. And I immediately get letters from the prime minister's office saying, oh, but you know, it's wrong. They still believe that we have a power of opinion, we intellectuals. I don't know what it is, but anyhow. So th there is a space, there is an emergent space, that is what I'm trying to say, that is both local, I, I'm telling you it's the return of the locality, and localities have features, you've got to know the localities, and global. It's a globality that is partial, multi-sited, and in many ways horizontal. 
This is not the global as a concentrated power like the big multinational corporations have, right? So what I, when I speak about immigrants mattering, it's not just about us here. It's about where the immigrants came from. We have de facto right now in Germany a global network if we could align with them. They connect to all kinds of... I don't know how many nationalities you have in Germany, but I'm sure you have at least 70. Right or not? Am I totally wrong? What? There you go. Exactly. There you go. That is what it means. Now, the temporal frame can be disturbingly long. Justice for janitors took a long time, but those t type learned. You know what then happened? Amsterdam's corporate center, London's corporate center, the metal workers, the big metal workers union of Germany in Frankfurt, they brought those people in from the United States, mostly Latinos and Latinas, to help them. How did you organize the service sectors in these very powerful sectors? There are histories right now that are being made that we all need to know about. The knowledge vector is critical. The more we learn about all of this, the more we believe, and not believe, the more we can see, yes, there is an operational space where I can step in. Now, back to your Hungarians. Ah, my God, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it's a trajectory. And, and right now, I think you have some very powerful uh, leadership there that is taking them totally in the wrong direction. You know, that is, you can't contest everything. But I'm really talking about operational spaces. It is not the whole city. Um, yeah. may I, I ask one uh, more question for some quick responses, and then I want to open it up. Um, Hungary it seems to me to be a good example of, of, a, of a place where the political vocabulary is being captured by a particular group of people, and it's, an, it's a powerful way of explaining, and there's not enough contestation of that vocabulary. In your answer about the question of fear, um, you, you were good in emphasizing that actually we can empower people by showing them how much power for change they have. The cleaner in the house uh, of the important person is actually in a position of a lot of power. That's, the, that's, that, that's one of the things that could give us uh, courage. Um, and uh, the, other, the other reflection that came out of, of your remarks, and it leads to my question, is, is if you ask about... Uh, you ask about courage of people on, on, on Occupy Wall Street staying out for several nights in the cold and so on and so forth. One place that probably comes to mind for, for, for many of us, uh, also people who, who lived through it, are the, are the people who stayed in the cold and uh, dark for, for months in, in Ukraine uh, for an idea of Europe. And that leaves to my, at least is one way of, uh, uh, of thinking of that. It's a contested uh, question. Uh, and, and there, there's a huge potential uh, performative gap in terms of expectations and uh, reality of what is happening. The question leads on from those scattered remarks and is... <laughs> uh, sure. No, I mean, there's a, there's a geopolitical uh, long context to, to bring it to it. But the simple question is, is this one. Um, how can we reframe Europe as a term uh, that can really be used as a way of mobilizing around these kinds of ideas that, that you mentioned, Saskia? How can, we, how can we take that? It's the mission of European alternatives at the end of the day. It's what I'm interested in. How can we take uh, this idea of Europe and try, despite the everything you could throw at it, all the disappointments you could throw at it, try and use it as a way of mobilizing. The first little critical remark I would like to do is, who is we? Yeah? Because you mentioned Hungary, um, Jobbik, which is uh, not Fidesz, but Jobbik, the highest uh, scores highest in the age group 18 to 25. So to think that Jobbik is a sort of old fashioned to eat, uh, you know, whatever thing, yeah, and they go nationalist, this is and this is amazing me. I'm just posing the question: Who is we in Hungary? Yeah, the youth of Hungary is not democratic. If you read these figures, right? So who is we then? Yeah, do they want an alternative if they are just fan of Orban or Jobbik? I mean, we just have to put a question mark if we read the data. By the way, for France, it's striking. But 32% uh, in the age group of 18 to 25 vote Le Pen which is the highest score of any of the age groups, yeah? So that is 
The, this is this, yeah, okay. My, yeah. But th it's not that the, you know, you could have said five years ago that Le Pen is the old fashto anti Semit uh, voting class of white men in 60s arrondissement in Paris. This is no longer true. That's what I'm pointing to. So who is we? Yeah, we, we just put this in. And then uh, what to do with Europe and for the European sort of discourse. And here I pick up on what Saskia said reoccupy the state. I wouldn't say reoccupy, but I would say, could we go for a new positive connotation of what the state is, which is that the state is the organizer of the public good, that the state, by definition, is something good. I'm born 64. I was risen in the sense that the state is something good. We lost that. We lost it, especially in the US. I have been doing a lot of transatlantic things, and I'm amazed how in the last 20 years this sort of status crap discourse in the US could just pick the whole, I mean, with the exception of New York Public Radio and the New Yorker, there's nobody left in the US who would think that uh, the state is good in, in, in the US, right? You have a couple of, you know, uh, uh, you can count the people in, in upper, uh, you know, downtown Soho, New York, who would, uh, <laughs> who go to the St. Mark's bookshops, but let's... Uh, the, the Okay, no, but, but here, here's my point. The state as capacity, the state as practice right now is terrible. Yeah, terrible, I but 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 that the, pra the capability of the state is terrible has led to the public conviction or perception that the state is no longer the performant actor, okay? And this is what fuels people in all these discourses, and we can talk about discourses and linguistics, which is really interesting to look at, why now most of people, and I'd say even in Germany, because we copy everything you do bad, and now it's here too, that state is actually bad, and that public, or that private actors can do better everything, yeah? This is what's happening here. Luckily enough, with the European Union, we prevented the privatization of water because we had that citizen initiative, and we could raise a, a, a million of uh, signatures that water should not be privatized. So we have a little bit of that citizens thing which is already missing in the US, but it's too weak because even here, uh, they, the business can do what they want. They can sank millions in, you know, for uh, power plants in Brazil. We are still believing that BASF is more competent and more smarter people than we have sitting in the state and its presentations and so on and so forth. So we have been changing a discourse from status by definition a good thing into status by definition rather a poor thing. And here I come to my point, what is this... Uh, has to do with Europe. The problem with Europe is that we are completely undecided of whether or not we should dare to say that Europe is a state, should be one, could be one, under which conditions it perhaps could be one, and so and, and so forth. So we have created the territory, we have even created the money. We don't have created the democracy because we don't even know whether we dare to call it a state. And this is like what Moldemore in Harry Potter's, yeah, the person's name we do not ought to pronounce. Yeah, Is Europe a state or not. So we have built a whole discourse which is about governance and uh, cooperation, cooperation of states and intergovernmental and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, And this is basically like the Katze um den heißen Brei. I don't know how to say it in English. But it's because we do not depict what Europe is, Europe cannot work. Because there, Europe doesn't do the social thing because the social is linked to the state, so it's the welfare thing. Europe does not do European unemployment assurance. Europe does not do the uh, wage minimum. This is all the things Europe does not do. But even if you look on the sort of the corporate or the prosperity side, I give you just one example and then I stop. But I had a talk with Obermann when Obermann was still the CEO of Deutsche Telekom. And you wouldn't assume that Obermann is neither left nor a whatever uh, um, Marxist guy. Yeah, He would go and say the whole politics of the European Union, which is all about either deregulation or liberalization in terms of the internet policy is crap wrong. Why? Because I'm not going to build as Deutsche Telekom, the broadband for whole Germany, to then have the European Commission deregulate the market and letting O2 and Vodafone all steal my money because I need to do the infrastructure building and I don't get a return. So either we have a European oligopole, which is taking European money in our hands, and then we build the grids. And the grids is not only ICT, information uh, technology, but also could be energy, could also be infrastructure and so on and so forth. And we take European money, which should not be money we have, but even money we take credit
what it's for. Yeah, The European Union as an institution today cannot lend money, but should have the capacity to lend money, had it the capacity to be a state, or we wanted it to be a state. So what I'm arguing here is if we would be able to first connotate a positive definition of a state, and then would we would dare to give that connotation to the European Union, we would have a tool set out there to build what a state did 100 years ago, which is the infrastructure in energy, post telecommunication, and the whole thing we did last year, last century. Not only by then we had strong unions, we had strong oligopoles, all these state institutes would have return on investments and we would have growth because we had this infrastructure set up here. So that is what Obermann told me we would do. So now in a neoconserved discourse it doesn't fly, nobody's out there uh, to argue that we should build European oligopoles for being building infrastructure, but here's my thought, why not? Why not in a way? And then you now you look and that's the last sentence, why is Europe economy not working, not because allegedly hardworking Germans don't pay money for lazy Greeks. Yeah, The real transfer need between the poorer and the richer parts of Europe is not Germany to Greece or Finland to Italy. If you look at an atlas, there's an atlas which is called the Social Atlas of Europe, you can easily see that the, the income discrepancy of Europe are periphery to center and um, rural areas to um, uh, urban areas. Yeah, And this is across the European Union. You can be in Ardèche, it's poor, and in Ile-de-France it's rich, and you can be in uh, Bologna, it's wealthy, and in southern Italy it's poor. You can be in Mekpom, it's poor, but you can be in Hessen, it's rich, and so on and so forth. It just has nothing, but nothing to do with national borders. It has to do with mega cities, with towns, and with rural and left behind areas. And why are rural areas left behind? To a large extent, because they don't have broadband, because they cannot develop, because they're not connected to the economy which drives the economy today, which is the internet. And why does this not happen? Because the European Union is not a state and cannot take money in its hand to build a huge oligopole for three things, energy grids, telecommunication grids, and for transportation grids. Okay. That's just a gesture. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe um, now is the time I'd like to open it up to the audience, if, if that's okay, and, and, and get some reactions or questions, and then uh, my friends up here can react to what's been said and the questions if they, if they would like. So you need to borrow some mics. So I saw over over there the gentleman there. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Nicola. Uh, Martin, Citizens for Europe in Berlin. Um, you asked the question, what can we do about this devastating picture Zaskia Zassen presented us this last two hours? Is there's a couple of shining stars arising in Europe, and for example, I don't know if there are people from Spain around here but you have Podemos. Podemos is a really a big shining movement that is probably gonna take on the political power in the next year in the city of Madrid, but also perhaps getting the prime minister. And that is a movement that came from the indignados and has been able to push the power from the streets into power and politics. So let's connect with those people. You don't hear anything in German media of that because they've dramatically I mean, they're, they're afraid of what is going to happen with the politicians if citizens become politicians. So it's a question of power. So let's connect with those guys. Let's look at the self-organized ECI around the TTIP. They collected 750,000 signatures in the last 10 days. Of course, there's about 600,000 coming from Germany. But there's a couple shining stars we should hold on to, which we should empower and get ourselves organized around those movements because they have the answer on local level that we can bring this answer to global level. Thank you. Maybe let's take the, the remark just in front and then I'll come over here. Oh, I, just in front of Martin there was another one and then we take one more and then we come back. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of ask the question because you said we have to reoccupy the state and I think Ulrike already kind of challenged it, said do we reoccupy it or do we have to redefine it or kind of rethink it, but um, what you did not say is how should we do that? For me, the state and as well, kind of the democracy that comes with it is or at least was a means to overcome our collective action problem that we have as citizens. Um, so then the question is what are the means do we have? And for me, this was also something that I was missing in your keynote, this is like how do we do it? How do we make sure we have a citizenship and how can we reconnect? Thank you, and then we take one more and 
and the reaction. Um, Daniel Kutch, a f philosopher and uh, freelance journalist. Ulrike, thank you very much for uh, summarizing that very, very poignantly, uh, the, the question of Europe state. And I, I, was, w I was wondering, uh, is there a possibility to, um, do you see a, a way to, how do you reconstruct the legitimacy of a state in the European context? Uh, what is the, is there a story that we can tell each other uh, in order to do that? Uh, I would wonder what you think. We'll take those three, if it's okay, and then we see, we get a couple more. Who would like to start? I can, I can start. Um, that's right, I didn't talk strategy or tactics, partly because we're dealing with many, many different countries here in Europe and in other parts of the world. So I do think that when I say, that, well, that it, it, there is enormous diversity. And so like Podemos took everybody by surprise, right, in Spain. That was very impressive. It didn't go like that in other, in other parts. They were all in jail, <laughs> right? So, so um, but I think there are particular action spaces that emerge in country after country. And they can be very partial. So, so the image that I have about action is really quite pragmatic at this point, rather than the idealized, what we ought, what ought to be the outcome. So I think it's this juxtaposition of very specific local structures. There is no more broad front at this point, I think, in politics. The, the strength of political oppositions is coming from very particular sectors that they know about, the water sector, the immigration question, the you know, stuff, the anti-nuclear in the case of Germany. You know, there are many, many specific, this seems to be a feature. I say, fine, the pragmatic in me says. We operate here, we op in all of these, diff not we, but every, every group with its own. We connect with, across those same sectors, globally. That to me is a, is a strategy. Now when I say reoccupy the state, it doesn't mean physically we're going to go and occupy agency after agency. The United States has 802 <laughs> administrative agencies. Now, that is not the project. The project is to begin to develop agendas, you know, core issues that need to be addressed. Now, partly, they're also a pragmatic move. Right now, all the big banks have huge lawsuits against them. Right now, the money is leaving speculative finance because they know that is a sector in trouble. I mean, some of you must have heard, like $13 billion. Mind you, that is uh, uh, for City Corp. That is child's play money. That is not serious. So right now, people are actually getting very interested in doing some of those types of investments that you were alluding to, right? That what do we need? We need this and that sort of productive investments, which I think is a good thing. So you just have to, under, you have, to have knowledge. I am one who really believes that the more we understand about a given situation that can be a country, that can be a sector globally, the better we are prepared. Now, the state is not an angel. The state is also about power. So I am not going to idealize the state. What I ask from the state, a bit like you were saying, is ensure public transport, public infrastructure, public schooling, public health, et cetera, et cetera. And give us some accountability on how you use our money. So there are very specific projects involved in there. It is not a holistic thing. You know, and, and that is sort of my take. Now, for me to, to really seriously address this, I have to take a particular country that I know well and then illustrate, and that is why I didn't talk. I wanted to give you some of these trends that take acute forms in the United States, but that are happening in other countries as well. You know, as a sort of a, an empirical landscape where you can see. I got involved, by the way, with a private water thing in Germany, I was invited to, that was several years ago, and there were all the directors of all the water authorities of Germany, this was in München, a very good mayor in München at that point, I don't know, I think that must have been eight years ago or something like that when this debate started. And it was a very interesting meeting, I must say, though, because most of the directors did not want the privatizing of water, and they were right, you don't privatize water, if you privatize water, it becomes a monopoly it's as clear as that, you know, that is what happens with some sectors. So even if you're a traditional economist, you can make an argument about that. Okay. Thank you. 
I take the question about this sort of construction or deconstruction of what is a state. I mean, first I go with Saskia, which is we have to look really in terms of theoretical underpinnings of what word means. I mean, what is a middle class today? What is a state today? What is sovereignty today? Yeah. What is sovereignty today? I mean, we need really philosophers to give us new notions about new meanings and, you know, and, and new words, just new words. I'm convinced since a long way or time now that Europe doesn't work because we didn't find the words for what Europe should be, right? It's really about wording. So am I now going to argue that Europe should be a state or we should envision it as a state in the, you know, old terms of a nation state? No, obviously not, because we are talking about horizontal transnational movements Movements. We are talking about global constitutionalism. We are, glo we are basically talking about something like global citizenship, about global movements on environment and so on and so forth. So Europe can only be the ebosh, you know, a little sort of what uh, em embryon to, to make this happen. If we Europeans would like to understand us as the avant-garde to make this happen, because I'm not seeing this coming out of Africa, I'm not seeing this coming out of current Russia, I'm not seeing this, unfortunately, coming out of China, right? So we should not of the US, very unfortunately, very sad about the US these days, me. So if, if this is, I mean this seriously, um, if, if this is true, then perhaps we should take this avant-garde role and give you one sentence. I was also on a conference last weekend, by the way, together with Hauke, and I heard from an ethnologian who, who gave me the sentence, the migrants are the avant-garde of Europe. And I stumbled about that sentence. But what she meant is actually because the, uh, the migrants are basically appealing to the very core of the value set of Europe and depicting that Europe is not delivering these values because the migrants stand there in Lampedusa, they want to go into that prosperity and we are just refusing them with Frontex and so on and so forth. So the migrants are the avant-garde of Europe. If we take that serious, then we work on very basic principles with our Melio, human rights, law of order, rule of law, and so on and so forth, which we European pretend to have for us. Russia doesn't even pretend this, nor does China do. The Europeans did one, but do, does a bit less. So this is our capacity to be an avant-garde. So coming back to the state, yes, in a way I want a state in the sense that I want an political entity who, which recaptures these values and makes them happen. I'm not arguing a sort of nation state which then sh would have sort of close borders about Europe, yeah? but I'm arguing in a sort of political entity which free citizens vo vote for, go for, and which is basically open for everybody who joins them on that concepts of value. And here I'm very thankful to Hauke who wrote a marvelous book, and you should all read it, Das Doppelte Gesicht Europas, I think it's only available in German, but where he makes the case that we all should reread Kelsen, who is an Austrian Staatsrechtslehrer, and who says that the avenue to go there to that sort of new form of what a European state, or I say, as I always do in these uh, formats now, European Republic is under construction. Yeah, Get away with the United States of Europe. We do not want to model the US. We do not want to copy the US. We do not want to integrate states. We want to integrate European citizens. We want to keep it open. We want to work on European democracy. So United States of Europe was yesterday, European Republic is tomorrow, which could be an open concept. And how do I go there? I read Kelsen like Hauke taught me to do, which is that we need to deconstruct the word of Volkssouveränität, people's sovereignty. The sovereignty is an individual, an individualisierbares concept. Sovereignty is a concept which can be individualized. The moment you individualize it and you don't go for collective sovereignty, which is you mean only people have a sovereignty that they render to whatever political entity, we are nearly there. Each and every citizen of Europe and who can be one and wants to be one and included is every migrant can construct and can be can construct the European Republic and can become member of such a European Republic. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I think uh, there's much true with that uh, idea of individualizing and there's also much yeah <laughs> there's also much true uh, with uh, that idea of a the, in the society, a decentralized strategy of reconstructing something like a union movement, yeah, local, yeah. Uh, like the, uh, not very popular, but uh, as a paradigm, yeah, these small unions, yeah, like those of the train uh, drivers and uh, uh, pilots, yeah, uh, they 
There could be much more of them. And the cleaning ladies in the apartments of the rich, yeah? So uh, that is, that is a, that these are very interesting strategies. However, there's also some need for collective action, yeah? And some need for transnational strikes, let me say. Some kind of transnational class struggle, yeah? Uh, um, in the United States, and the, uh, we should compare the United States with Europe. Yeah, you have to reconstruct also a central state again, whose powers you mentioned very rightly, yeah, which are very important, and we have to construct such a state here. Yeah, uh, uh, and to organize it in a way democratically. In the United States, it is still more democratic than in Europe. We had these, we have still these campaigns. There are more and more shine campaigns, yeah? But we had the campaign on the health care. Yeah, there was a real alternative. We, 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 we can get that now, prob possibly, uh, in Europe, yeah? Uh, if, for example, let me take this example to have a model of the minimum wages. There is, it is possible, as you said, yeah, uh, uh, there is possible to make a uh, um, uh, people's initiative, yeah, in Europe, in the uh, on the basis of the Lisbon Treaty. Yeah, then the uh, uh, Commission has to. It's all uh, uh, closed. Yeah, so the Commission has to decide if they take it, and so. But if you have enough, it's not so much. Yeah, if you have enough enough uh, uh, people to. Uh, yeah? Signatures. Signatures. Enough signatures, you have uh, a campaign, yeah? And if at the same time, in the European Parliament, like only as a thought experiment, they find a majority for minimum wages, yeah? And some unions go together, yeah, who are willing to strike transnationally for minimum wages, yeah? Which is very hard. Yeah, but if you have these things together, then you have suddenly a conflict between institutions like the European Parliament and the, uh, those who have re are really in charge, the executive bodies of Europe. And then this, 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 the, as long as they confirm with that play, they are powerful in Parliament. But once they are opposing, they are weak. But then they could become powerful again. And then then it might be the hour or the window open for a change of the institutional structure and, to re and the construction of some state power on the European level, which is needed to have something against the blackmailing power of global capital. One uh, quick thing. So what, one of the strategies that we have had in the United States is precisely multi-sited local. And that's now expanded to Europe. That, that's the janitors that I was talking about, where the big German metal, the metal is at a ganz große, nicht wahr? Yeah, they are the ones who are enabling that. And so there are many different types of strategies, I must say, that are happening. And also you can't assume that you can organize everybody. Like with the domestic workers, it's the ones that work in the households of professionals, which have those households have to work like clockwork because otherwise Wall Street suffers, you know. So that is very, but that doesn't mean that we have to stop from doing that. So multiple, multiple specialized interventions, so dealing with, with facts on the ground in a way, that's not enough to achieve the larger aim. Which, is, which aspires to much more, which aspires that we, the citizens, are truly makers of a politics, who are, that we are constitutive. Right now, we're consumers. We're not constitutive. We started out as constitutive of, right? And so I think that, that but I also think of trajectories. You know, it starts with one thing and then it moves. Historically speaking, even in the recent past, when you look at Latin America, surprising, turns of events is one way of putting it, surprising next steps in trajectories have happened. And that, I, I think we learn from what was possible 
across the world, even though our conditions, the conditions in each country are really specific and different. But when we take that kind of landscape, I say it can be done. No formal system of power has lasted forever. Let's face that. But you know what? It doesn't fall from the sky ready-made. You've got to make it in the end, you know? So anyhow, that's my... Very good. I'm, I'm looking towards somebody to tell me if we have time for more. Another, We have five minutes. So if you make your questions really sharp, and I make sure the answers are really sharp, we try and take a couple of questions. You've been waiting for a little while. Okay. Um. About reoccupy the state, I want just to. Uh, we say that this, the state is a um, working space of political negotia negotiation. Or, I don't think this is true anymore in, Euro in uh, Europe, in the European space. With the European Union, is not the state that can decide anymore, and is not the, at least is not the only political arena. And we have seen that with the economic crisis, uh, a lot of states has lost power, as we have seen Greece or Spain, Italy, all the the. Um, a lot of um, all the states that had uh, had to sign uh, the European Memorandum of Understanding, they have lost power. They are not uh, able to decide anymore. And do we really have to reoccupy those kind of states, or rather, uh, makes more sense to occupy the European space and make this that space more uh, meaningful for a new kind of citizenship, a new kind, a new possibility of we. And on the question of uh, w what is, and this is true, we don't know what Europe is, because Europe is on the making, but this is uh, our possibility, like to give sense to what Europe is and to uh, find a counter narrative on what is doing by the institution. And just uh, to step back on the question of the, uh, how do we find a connection in between uh, migrants that are excluded and citizens that are, should be included? Today, I think one of the, it's interesting, uh, um, the internal migration in Europe, they are uh, at the same time the same thing. They are citizens and they are migrants. They are excluded and they are included. And here we can find uh, the real link in between uh, the excluded and, and the included. Because I don't think that today even the citizens of Europe or other space are completely included. And we have okay. Okay. good space for new struggles. Thank you. I saw another hand around about here, I thought. No? No? There, I now see a hand clearly there, so. <laughs> a clear hand is what we wanted. Um, I wanted to ask about the way for change, because uh, mostly you don't really talk about that. Sure, you can organize protests or strike or something, but in the end, you're just forcing people who don't really want to do what you want them to do, to do something. So in the end, there are two ways to realize change. One is via elections in our demo democratic system, and the other one is revolution. So what kind of way would you suggest? Let's perhaps, let's perhaps take those and quick uh, remarks also as final remarks and then we'll have to, to close. All right, so um, of course revolution, I, I agree that what, what we have talked about here is a modest approach. Um, I think that, and this partly you know, goes also to you, the state is a capability. That's my starting point. I'm very pragmatic. We cannot afford to throw it out of the window. It took us centuries to make it. It combines, it can actually combine when it works well, and many states are not working well because they have been occupied by the logic of global capital, especially the executive branches of government, whether prime ministerial or presidential. So that's a serious problem. But still, a working state is a capability that we need to work with. So one of the things that I've written about is, uh, for instance, I mean, again, this is the pragmatism that I'm developing here. Uh, the, the, the executive branch of government in all our governments has learned a bit of internationalism. Along what vector? The corporate capital vector. I say, you know what? It has learned some internationalism. How about 
re-gearing that, and that takes work. And it's not only manifestations and protests by little bodies. It's all kinds of things. It's writing a language that allows us to understand the possibility of these projects. States have st changed quite a bit, so we know they can change. But I say, how about redeploying that internationalism? And again, I repeat, that's just one little element, all right, towards other global issues. Global health, guess what? It's emergent. <laughs> Whether we want it or not, it's a fact, right? Global environmental issues, it's emergent. Not in, the, not in the space of policy. The space of policy is getting us nowhere. But in the space of scientists and activists who are working together and exiting the space of policy and creating a de facto global project. And I have a lot of stuff because this is one of the projects I'm working on. So, you know, we cannot think about the state as this something that is out there in its offices. The state is to be inhabited with projects. And it's never going to be complete. There are always going to be differences between those, the labor se the secretary of labor and the secretary of whatever, finance, right? So it, there is no equality. I'm not talking about an idealized situation. But, that, but at the core, I don't want to repeat what I said before, at the core I want a, ca a capacity deployed for the public good very largely understood, for an enablement of new methodologies to address the environmental question, et cetera, et cetera. So now coming to your, uh, to your, um, to your set of issues, you know, I'm not seeing the state as a solution, but I'm seeing the state as an instrument. And it is a complex instrument, unlike so many other sectors. Look at the human rights regime, very specialized. Look at the environmental question, quite specialized itself. Very many, many good things are working along one vector, and that's fine. But we also need something that can combine and negotiate all these contradictions, because you take from one to give to the other, you know, that has to be taken care of. So I want to remember a bit, I guess, like you were doing also, that certain capabilities were deployed by our states that were positive capabilities. It was never benign. There was always war and destruction in the state. I'm not going to romanticize it. I just want to see it as a set of capabilities that we cannot give up, but that we have to somehow re-gear. And then I look at a broader operational space, and I say there are all kinds of things that are weakening. Powers that we thought were incontestable. High finance. High finance has done most of its damage. But right now, it's on a decline, luckily. And so that creates a bit of emptiness, and it creates a possibility, say, for certain monies to go into state projects, which before, when you had high finance producing super profits, it was not. So, you know, I could go on and on, but I know I have to end. So I just want to put it very clearly on the table, the state as a capability, not as some sort of state. A capability. A very complex one. Okay, thank you. Please. Yeah, I, I, I also wanted to um, uh, react to your question with the immigrants and uh, uh, citizenship, uh, and only concretize it a little bit in the case of Europe, because this example is very good. It, I think there's a continuum. Uh, of citizenship, national citizenship, European citizenship, and those who are immigrants from outside. Yeah, and you are very right that those who are internal European migrants, yeah, uh, they have, they, 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 have they, they show the situation also of those who come from Africa. Yeah, so the, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and we have to work on that, on that continuum. Uh, however, how to do that? Uh, this shows that there is need for more state in Europe, for more state power, more capability uh, of the state in specific areas. The court has decided and interpreted European Freizügigkeit, yeah? uh, the, 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 the freedom of, the, the, the free movement of persons, yeah? that there are no borders any longer in four or five judgments ever ra more radical, yeah? However, now they are coming. And 
there is no nothing to cope with it. Nothing with social welfare is clear and so on. And it needed social welfare uh, and social uh, redistribution of wealth in Europe and organization that should be done by a legislator yeah, who prepares situations when a lot of uh, uh, immigrants from uh, uh, southern Europe are coming, for example, to uh, German cities who are not helped by the, by the German state to cope with that situation. Yeah? So they have really a problem. Yeah? And, 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 and there we need, there's a lack of state power on the European level already. Yeah? That, that makes this clear that because now the government says, no, we don't want the immigrants. Yeah? They say, uh, we don't care about the judgment of the European Court. They care about it, yeah? But, uh, but this is not, not enough state, just a court, yeah? It needs more state power on the transnational level. Otherwise, I don't see any solution for these problems of uh, migration and citizenship. Yeah, because citizenship is secured by, yeah, let me say, a strong state. Can I do one sentence on this revolution question? So here I go. My grandfather was on the street on the 16th of June 53, which was the day when we had revolution in former GDR Berlin, and it was about bread prices. He went, he was a worker, no education, it was about rises of bread prices, right? Today bread prices are stable, butter prices still very low. And here's the thing, the Hartz four generation, so your peers in your age group, who is on Hartz IV, 78% do not vote, let alone that they're interested in the future of Europe. Yeah? Will they do a revolution? Not as long as they get a flat screen for free and a washing machine for free. So that is your problem for your generation. Yeah? And it's obviously a sociological problem that if the smartest part of the elites of the Alters cohort doesn't do the revolution but is not in touch with the Hartz IV peers, yeah, you are not going to do that revolution. If you ask me whether there is a need for a revolution, I say bloodily yes, obviously yes, because we are in a complete catch-22 in institutional terms in Europe which is the system cannot deliver the solutions we need. This is what we are in. So the only question is, how long are we all together living in a completely dysfunctional democracy in Europe? When will we basically change the system? What is a revolution? It's basically passing from one constitutional setting to a different constitutional setting. And the only question, but perhaps the promise of Europe is that in 89, we experience for the first time in history that what Europe can do is we can do peaceful revolutions. And that's my hope. Okay, thank you. With these, uh, with these closing words, we're going to wrap up this uh, panel. So, of course, I want to thank again Ulrika, Hoka and Saskia for uh, staying with us all this time. Um, I also want to thank uh, not only the Heinrich Bull Stiftung um, for making this possible, but also um, the Open Society Fund for Europe, of the Open Society Foundation, the Bundeszentrale for Politische Bildung, and also, uh, last but not least, the European Commission, who do support some events uh, that are critical sometimes. <laughs> and, and that's a good thing. So, um, I need to announce to you that now there's a, there's a break. Uh, at about at 5 p.m. sharp, we need to be gathered on the staircase uh, for a uh, short film about what is going to, uh, what we did over the last couple of days in the Fix Europe campus you heard a little bit about. And then the discussion is going to continue in here at 5 past 5 with the next panel. So join me in thanking again uh, the speakers. Thanks. Thanks.